Amen. Awesome. Well, today I have a word for you, and I don't mean a word like Christianese for God told me to tell you something. Uh, I mean an actual word, a word, one word, and that is anxious. Anxious. It has been an anxious week. Amen? Anybody? Anybody else? Yeah, same. To say that it's actually an, a huge understatement, whether you've said it or not, that, that anxiety, the anxiousness has uh, totally been there. And I have to admit that the word anxious and the concept of anxiety, it's, it's nauseating to me. And it's been a, a, a misused and kind of abused um, excuse for my generation, for millennials. We blame everything on anxiety. <laughs> we, we blame anxiety for every. Um, every issue that we face, and, and it's nauseating. And, and candidly, I struggle with sympathizing with the anxiety because I pride myself, and keyword pride, keyword pride, I pride myself in being pretty emotionless when it comes to things and pretty stoic when it comes to things and, and insensitive when other people are being sensitive. But if I were emotionally honest with myself, really the insensitivity and the emotionlessness or the stoicism is just a coping mechanism for the anxiety that I'm feeling inside my heart. And as we look at what's happening throughout this past week, we have gigantic things to be anxious about, big things to be anxious about, and maybe some more small things in your life Uh, Maybe the things in your life feel so gigantic that even the big gigantic things that are happening in the world seem small compared to what you have to go home to today or that trial that you're up against. But this week specifically, I mean, my Instagram feed is like, it's all consuming anxiety. It is, it's unbearable anxiety. And I had literally left my phone over there because I can feel it just Anxiety is pouring out of my pocket from my Instagram feed. And it's not just Instagram, it's all the media and, and just being consumed by this like impending doom of endless anxiousness. And we have the atrocities of the Hamas attacks on Israel and the fear of these sleeper cells of terrorism in the U.S. And on uh, Friday, we had the, 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 the national, whatever, uh, worldwide jihad day, uh, whatever that was. And all the, the all leaders, we have people saying, stay armed, be vigilant. And, and I, I get it, totally get it. But then there's the infighting amongst, amongst us Christians, and it's, it's brutal, Debates in the Christian community about Israel and the PA, Palestinian Authority, and we're called Zionists that are for the killing of innocent humans in Gaza if we support Israel's necessary opposition and retaliation. But then we're called Hamas terrorist sympathizers if we say anything about not wanting innocent Palestinians to die either. Newsflash, I don't want anyone innocent to die. I think that's a pretty a Jesus-like thing to believe. Um, But all of it is this building anxiety. And the eschatology on top of it all, too. Just the debates, endless, endless, endless debates. We have replacement theology and fulfillment theology and supersessionism and dispensationalism and all of it. All of it. It's crazy. It's chaos. It's, it's, It's a lot. And if you weren't anxious before... This afternoon, you're probably anxious now. You're welcome. (laughs) You are welcome. That's all I have. I just wanted to give that to you guys. Danny, come back up. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But the the anxiety of normal life is one thing, but then you have things like that are happening currently in current events, and it's unbearable. And I knew I was teaching this week, and in the anchored reading, I get to see into the future of, of where we're going to be. And so I knew, you know, months ago that I was going to be teaching here. And so I, I had this plethora of scripture to choose from because the past week has been all of Philippians and all of Colossians. And all of the theology and eschatology that's wrapped up in these, these books of the Bible that I, I had to choose from, uh, I, I'm feeling anxious about just preaching God's word and what to choose. And, and I want to speak into culture and what's happening 
around the world and just feeling that anxiety. And I'm anxiously reading through all of it, just asking the Lord to show me. And God knew exactly what I needed. He knew exactly what you needed, what we all needed as a church. And I got to Philippians 4 and these words, anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. And it's no coincidence. And it's not, it's not some magical thing that we happen to be in Philippians the past week while this is happening. And you don't have to feel disconnected from what God's doing in us as we're preparing our sermons because we're all reading the same thing if we're going through the anchored reading. And so as God's ministering to our hearts as a staff, as pastors, he's ministering, ministering to your guys' hearts as well. And God says, be anxious for nothing. Now, Pastor Rob, amazing, like seriously, the last services, 9 and 11, you must. It is, I am commanding you to go back and listening, listen to these sermons. And, and I, there is nothing about Israel and the Palestinian authorities and the Gaza that I can add to what he did. And, and you guys have to go and listen to that perspective that he gave. Um, but I, I don't, I'm not going to give you any of that. I, I don't want to be another, uh, a, a, another source when we're inundated with people that are smarter than me, that can do such an amazing job. You guys have that. We're, we're knowledgeable. We have those sources. But what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about is what we need. As much as we need the truth and information, we need peace. Peace. And, and you know what we mean when we say peace here at Godspeak. We don't mean the absence of conflict. Right? We don't mean the... The removal of the trial. We are not talking about no conflict. We're talking about the presence of Jesus in the midst of the conflict that we're going through. Amen. Amen. The conflict is actually very, very necessary. Militarily, spiritually, geopolitically, it is necessary. The conflict is necessary. But we're going to talk about the peace in your heart that you only get from the Lord. The freedom from the anxiety of it all. That feeling of impending doom. God says, be anxious for nothing. And like a good father, a good teacher, he doesn't just leave us there and say, hey, don't do that. He gives us the reason why. He gives us the why. And he doesn't just give us the why, but he gives us the how. And God can and will deliver us from the anxiety that the enemy wants us to soak in. He can and will lead us down the path to peace, peace, path, that's a lot of path, path, path to path, path to peace. <laughs> the path to peace, which is what we're going to look at today. This is where we're going to focus on. We're going to see what God says about being anxious for nothing and really understand what the path to peace is. And so we're going to look at In Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. You guys already have a Bible. We're going to stand and read God's word. Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Anxious for nothing. Anxious for nothing. You guys ready? We're going. Ready or not. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say Rejoice. Amen. (laughs) We're not done yet, though. We could be. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the peace that you give us, Lord, for showing us the path to that peace, Lord. We're, we're so grateful, Lord, that you 
don't just tell us not to be anxious, but you show us how to do that. Lord, I, I pray that you would show us, Lord, you would make it clear, Lord, you would guide us in this way. God, we give our anxiety to you and we ask that you would show us how, Lord, to have a peaceful heart, Lord, in the midst of all the chaos that we're surrounded by. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Awesome, take a seat. Take a seat. Be anxious for nothing. Nothing. Do you know what nothing means? Nothing. (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) The audacity of Paul. Paul, nothing? Are you serious? You don't know my struggles? (laughs) Talking to the apostle Paul. Let's get some context. We're going to get some context. Philippians, it's an amazing letter of encouragement. It's an encouraging letter to the church in Philippi, yes. The Philippines. (laughs) Close, close. Philippi. And the encouragement seems to be um, really the overarching theme of the letter. And, And the church... In Philippi was the very first Christian church in Europe. And if you remember in Acts 16, this is about, in Acts 16, about 13 years, give or take, before Paul is writing this letter to the church. About 13 years before, and he, before he had planted this church, he was in Galatia. I have a map for you. If you are my age, maybe this is the first time you've seen a map. This is what people used to use. To navigate. Uh, <laughs> do you guys remember that when we would print out maps, like MapQuest, in our cars? And that's crazy. <laughs> so does anybody still do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Sometimes you just need a map. <laughs> so, so Paul is in Galatia. Do you guys see Galatia? Up there. Galatia. He's in Galatia. And he was, considering, he, was, he was considering preaching the gospel in Asia, and the Holy Spirit said, no, don't do that. That's weird. God, why not? So he's in Galatia, Holy Spirit says no, then he's like, okay, well then I guess I'll go to Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit says, no. All right, isn't, how, how? isn't that crazy how sometimes God says no? But you notice how Paul, he doesn't, he doesn't, just assume it's a no. He goes through the doors that are open and he stops when the door is closed by the Lord. And he, he doesn't wait. He just keeps going. God, what next? Okay, you said no. Now what? And so, so what happens is he finds himself in Troas. You see Troas over there to the left, the west of, of Bithynia. And he, he finds himself there in Troas, in this coastal city, no doubt seeking the Lord, trying to figure out, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And he gets a vision from God of a Macedonian man that says, please come help us in Macedonia. Please come help. So Paul, he sets sail across. You guys see Philippi over there, Philippi. He gets there and he, he knows that God's called him to Macedonia. And we have our, 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 our first um, converts, Lydia and their household, and he, he, he starts this really epic church. It's a mega church, the biggest church in Macedonia. He becomes super rich and famous, and he buys a jet. <laughs> no, that's not what happens. No, actually, after his first converts, after his first converts, he, he's harassed, he's being harassed by a slave girl, and he, he exercises a, a, a demon out of her. She's demon-possessed. And then he's thrown into prison. Thanks a lot, Holy Spirit. I should have just gone to Asia or Bithynia. I probably wouldn't have gotten thrown in jail there. And uh, where God guides, he provides. Amen, brother. Sometimes he provides a jail cell for you in obedience. Sometimes. Sometimes. And then we have this iconic scene where Paul and Silas are in jail, in prison. They're worshiping. They're rejoicing in the Lord. They're rejoicing. And what happens? The the chains break. There's an earthquake. The doors open. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. 
The keeper of the prison gives his heart to the Lord radically. His whole family is baptized. His whole family is baptized. And, and Paul then, he just kind of chills in the, in the area and he, he, he really presses in. And he, after a fruitful ministry, he's in Rome and, and he, he's really working really hard. And then he, he ends up being the senior pastor of the largest church in Rome. No, nope. Yet again, He's thrown into prison, again, in Rome. And many times, he's in prison. He's in prison. He's in prison. He's following the Lord in prison. He's still, so 13 years later, now he's in prison again in Rome. 13 years after all of this happening. And what is he doing? He's awaiting his potential and probable execution in prison in Rome, the tail end of his ministry, and instead of going, why God, I've, I've faithfully served you. I've been beaten for you. I've been jailed for you multiple times. Why? Why can't I just retire in peace? No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Instead, he remembers back to the, the faith-filled memories, being in jail with Silas, rejoicing, rejoicing, worshiping the Lord. And instead of saying, why God? He decides to write this letter of encouragement to the church, established through persecution. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, not from his ivory tower where he doesn't understand anxiety, but from prison, from jail, thinking back to rejoicing with Silas in prison. The testimony of God's faithfulness in rejoicing in prison and seeing the walls fall down, propelling him through the 13 years of beatings and and jail, and brutality, and now 2,000 years later to us, in this first verse in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And, and we see this idea of rejoicing. Rejoicing in, he's saying, trust me, guys, trust me. Trust me. Now, when I was a, a, a kid, I was with my dad often driving in his car. He had this amazing sound system in his Infinity, and he, he, it was so cool. He had a 15-inch subwoofer in his trunk, and it just was so epic. And, he, and as rejoice in the Lord always, as, I, as I'm reading this verse, there's this, this song that it felt like it was on repeat. It was like the, must have been the only album that he had, and it was Israel and New Breed live from another level. And I think the, the, second, the second song on, on this on this album was Rejoice in the Lord Always. And so as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm hearing this song, this epic experience being with my dad. And I don't think it's any coincidence that my dad is on the forefront of my mind as I'm preparing the sermon. Because if anybody in my life has been an example of what it means to rejoice in the Lord always, it is my father. If you've ever met him, you know, you just look at him, you're like, what's right with that guy? Like something about Jeff, like he's just always rejoicing in the Lord. Like it doesn't matter. Like, dad, why, why are you so happy? Like why? And my friends would say that, like, why is your dad so like joyful all the time? And they would expect me to give them like kind of a different answer. Like, well, you never, you don't know my dad. You but no, I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, seriously, I ask the same question all the time. And, and it's not that he, he was never, it's not that he never felt anxiety but he knew how to rejoice in the Lord. Look, he disciplined me all the time. He really, he disciplined, he did not spare the rod. He did not spare the rod. And I needed it. I really did need it. Some of you guys are offended. <laughs> I'm okay. I survived. And some, somehow he was rejoicing even in that. Even, even in discipline, rejoicing. And, and, and my mind is always just, and, and even to this day, the, the joy of the Lord that exudes from my father. And how can anyone have joy like that? How? It, 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 it seems humanly impossible because it is humanly impossible. The key is in the verse. The key to, to, have, to rejoicing, having joy, rejoicing in the Lord always is in the verse in the Lord, not rejoice in yourself always, that would be the impossibility, but rejoicing in the Lord always. 
That's what makes it possible. Joy and gladness rooted in God Almighty is the only joy that is always accessible. It's always accessible to us because his mercy and love for us is infinite. Because he is infinite. He is always. So joy in him is always. All other gladness in our lives, it will come to an end. But rejoicing in the Lord, it never has to end. Just in the previous chapter in Philippians chapter 3, it says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. For the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. How much does the knowledge of Jesus mean to you? How much does knowing the Lord mean to you? Knowing Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus should physiologically change who you are, how you act, what you do. All of it's rubbish that I may gain Christ, that I may gain Christ. In this this passage, the next verse in verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at Hand. The Lord is at hand. The NASB 1995 version says, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Gentle spirit. I love how Paul throws this in as, as a tag on, on this idea that the Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is, isn't the end times an excuse for me to just freak out and not be gentle? Isn't it, isn't it an excuse to be mean and abrasive and yell at people? <laughs> No, Paul says the opposite. God is near. Let people see your gentleness, regardless of your eschatology. Your gentle spirit is a sign that you are secure in your understanding that the Lord is at hand. If your eschatology is making you angry and anxious, then your perspective is wrong. You don't understand what it means for God to return for us. If the Lord is coming soon and you know him, should that not be good news? Rejoice! It reminds me of the last verse of one of my favorite hymns, How Great Thou Art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art. What joy shall fill my heart. Not what anxiety shall fill my heart. You're not scared when dad gets home if you haven't done anything wrong. If you're in right standing in his household, you're not scared when he gets home. When, my, when I get home from work and my kids haven't done anything wrong and there's nothing, there's nothing to level against them, when I get home, there's nothing but rejoicing. If you're anxious about the return of Jesus to the earth, you don't understand you're standing with him. You're standing with the Father. Your, your sin has been covered. There is nothing to be anxious about. Jesus is coming back is not an excuse to suddenly forget that you're joyful. It should actually be the opposite. You should be the most joyful now. If you, be, if you truly believe that all of the things happening in the world right now are pointing to Jesus' return, it should fill you with joy, not angst. Amen? Walking with Christ gives us hope. Walking with Christ casts out all fear. Walking with him, it brings perfect peace And your eschatology should be just as much a testimony and reflection of what it looks like to walk with Jesus. You may be the people's last glimpse of Jesus as their humble redeemer before judgment. Before judgment. What joy shall fill my heart? What joy shall fill my heart? Is is Jesus' return, is the Lord being near, fill you with joy? Or does it make you anxious? Or does it make you anxious? It it leads us to the crux of this passage. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Anxious, greatly concerned, or solicitous, respecting something future or unknown, being in painful suspense, applied to persons as to be anxious for the issue of battle. The issue of battle. One of the most annoying things about this verse, be anxious for nothing. Nothing. There's no wiggle room. There's no wiggle room. And the other part of this verse that's really difficult is that this is not a suggestion. This is a command. We're being commanded by God to be anxious for nothing. We have to obey that 
commandment. And, and I think about this, the, the fact that there is no wiggle room. I think, like, Paul, couldn't you have treated anxiety more like alcohol in Scripture? Where it's, like, anxious in, in moderation. Like, don't be given to anxiety. Like, pastors, like, you can, like, like uh, just don't be given to it. Have, like, make sure it, it doesn't have any, like, don't, no. No, but it's crazy how, it's crazy how our legalist minds like to apply the legalism to the things that there are, there's, there's exceptions for, but then you don't see anybody going around being legalistic about being anxious. Like God explicitly says, be anxious for nothing, nothing. That is a commandment in God's word. It would have been infinitely easier. And then we could have just kind of all gathered around and had endless debates about when it is or is not a sin to be anxious. No, there is no wiggle room. There is no room for the one who walks with Jesus for anxiety. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to break down all the different kinds of anxiety. And after extensive research, it was like two and a half minutes of research, I realized that there were too many, (laughs) way too many. Just a few here. We have generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder. Don't raise your hands. This isn't like a... (laughs) I don't care if you've been diagnosed with any of this. Social anxiety disorder, specific phobias, agoraphobia, separation anxiety, selective mutism. My kids have that for sure. Medication-induced anxiety disorder. That's just, we call that a bad trip. Uh, (laughs) I came up with one. I came up with one kind of anxiety. Reading about anxiety disorders induced anxiety disorder. (laughs) And, and I'm really, like, racking my brain, like, God, like, what, what's the difference between, like, I don't, I'm not someone who just believes, that, like, there's no place for medical diagnosis about this stuff, but like, what, like, what is this? And, and I really could boil it down to two different categories. There, there are two different things that, that you, can, you can be anxious about, and you can be anxious about things that you cannot change, and then you can be anxious about things that you can change, and worrying about either of those things is wrong. And when you worry about the things that you cannot change, what you're doing is you're asserting yourself into a place only reserved for God. Only reserved for God. If you can't change it, then it's not your problem. We are God's children, and when we worry about the things that we cannot change, we place the responsibility of our Father on our own shoulders. A good father insulates his children from the anxieties that are not for them. We need to have that childlike faith in God's house. It would be like my four-year-old, Elliot, worrying about, like, Dad, I need a a cost breakdown of all the bills. I need to know how much money we have left and and how much rent is so that I can make sure that... And and it's like, Elliot, you don't want to know, dude. You really don't want to know. There is nothing you can do about it, Elliot. There is nothing you can do about it. So don't worry about it. And kids are... We're, kids are really good at that. And I remember, I, I can think back and... ...me from that worry. They insulated me from the anxiousness of things that I could not control. It needs to be us in the hands of our, our Almighty Father. How much more will our Father in heaven provide? And Paul is actually echoing Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6. In Matthew 6, 25 through 34. It's a longer passage, but it, it's, it's really good. I, I'm not going to read all of it. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will p- put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? And and going on, skipping some of the passages at the end. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Charles Spurgeon has really an awesome, an awesome quote about cares. If God cares for you, why need you care too? Can you trust him for your soul and not for your body? He has never refused to bear your burdens. He has never fainted under their weight. Come then, soul. Have done with fretful care and leave all thy concerns in the hand of a gracious God. Amen? Amen. Well, I mean, just the beard alone. (laughs) 
<laughs> amazing, amazing beard. Uh, and so, so, so just because we understand that and, and, and we understand the things that we cannot change, giving those to God, what about the things that we can change? It doesn't, it doesn't absolve us from the responsibility of doing everything that we can to everything that we can that's, that's humanly possible in these situations to take care, to take care. The things that you are worrying about that you can change a lot of times are just a result of laziness. It, the anxiety is a, a result of lack of preparation. The anxiety is a, a result of, of not investing in a relationship like you should have. And, and really, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whether you're, you're worrying about something that you cannot change or you're worried about something that you can change, God shows us here what our response should be. Regardless, our response should be. Regardless of the subject of your anxiety, whether it's Hamas or what you're going to eat for lunch, it, your response or, or whatever it might be, whatever your worries are, in 4, 6, anxious, but in everything by prayer and supplication. If it's just, I, I, don't, I don't have anything to eat tomorrow, or I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Everything by prayer and supplication. Anxious for nothing, but prayer for everything. This is the opposite of that uh, kind of unfortunate mindset that I think a lot of us find ourselves in. And that's, we strive, we, we try to do everything we can, and then we realize that there's nothing left to do but pray. All I can do now is pray. All I can do now is petition to the creator of the universe that holds everything in the span of his hands. All I can do, again, the household analogy works so well because I'm spending, I spend so much time with my kids and, and this idea of children, this childlike faith, it would be like my kids owing money to somebody, like $1.99 for a candy bar, and then freaking out about it for an entire week. And finally, they've done everything they can. They can't find enough change. And they're like, well, I, I guess all we can do now is ask dad. It's like, why did you wait a week to ask me? It's nothing to me. It's $1.99. I'm here. I will provide for you. Why are you worrying about these things? In everything by prayer and supplication. We go to our father first, always, in everything. There is nothing too big or too small for God. Nothing too big or too small for God. And the, the word supplication, supplement, supply. This is a prayer of uh, focused around wanting or needing something, an entreaty to God. It's okay to ask God. A lot of times we don't get because we don't ask. We don't get because God is not too busy for you. It's the worst feeling in the world to be too busy for your kids. And sometimes you have to be. Sometimes I am too busy to do something with my kids. Some of you might say, well, you got your priorities mixed up. I, I, no, I have my, my priorities are serving the Lord, and sometimes he rearranges the other things. Sometimes you have to be too busy for your kids at work or whatever it might be. God doesn't have to, so why would he ever be? It's insulting to God to assume that he is too busy for his children. He doesn't have to be too busy. He would never intentionally feel that way about his children, his children. We have to ask. He's not too busy for your need. He's not too busy for your need. And, and the other part of this, Thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Let your requests be known to God. The, the, the mere fact that we could let something be known to God is crazy because he's omniscient. Doesn't he already know? And a lot of times we take that, that fake humility kind of prayer. Like, God, you already know. You already know. He's like, yeah, I know. But the crazy thing about a request is that it's active. It's like your salvation. You, God knows that you don't want to go to hell. But you have to request. A, a request that is not made cannot be answered. He can't say yes to a, a request that hasn't been offered. And I can't talk about that concept for too long without my brain falling out of my head. But the, the, the concept that God knows but, but wants us to ask. There's this active participation in our relationship with the Lord. Active participation. He wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything prayer and supplication. Everything prayer and supplication. Paul says something very similar about rejoicing and, and, and thanksgiving in, in 1 Thess- Thessalonians 5, 16, 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians, I have to say that one really slow. 5, 16 is an easy one to memorize. It's two words. Even I can do that. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Always, all of our requests and supplications, all of, in thanksgiving, everything give thanks. Everything give thanks. All of the requests that we make, the the requests, the supplications, God, I need something, they should all be sandwiched between thankfulness. We sandwich our requests between thankfulness, with thankfulness. God's kids aren't a bunch of whiny, entitled brats that just go to him and ask and ask and ask and ask. It's in thankfulness. Thankfulness. God, I just don't understand why. Thankfulness. Thankfulness. I'm just so sick of so un- Thankfulness. God, thank you. It's, it's about a 10%, a 10% return rate for the thankfulness when God does something. We see that in, in the story of the 10 lepers, right? Well, only one of the 10 come back and say, hey, hey by the way, thanks for healing me. Thanks, thanks for all that you do. And I'm so, I'm so bad at this. I, 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 I engage with God. When I need something, man, I am so close to the Lord. I am, I am zoned in. I'm fasting. I deleted Instagram. I'm going, I'm going in. God, please speak to me. Please help me get through this sermon. Please, I can't do this without you. I can't do this without you. And then he pulls through, and then it ends, and I'm like, oh. I pull my phone out and just, like, redownload Instagram. Sick. And I just wait until the next like anxious riddled thing that comes up. And I'm like, oh yeah, uh, God, please. I need you so bad right now. I can't do this without you. And then he pulls through. No, go back. As, as intently as you're, as you're seeking him in supplication, go back in thankfulness. And what that does is it, it, it doesn't just bless his heart, but it, it bolsters your faith. To take time, it's, it's, it's actually a, a business structure, a, a model that, that is so important for a team model where after a big event, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of companies, a lot of churches, they just move on. They start charging for the next thing without actually having a debrief of that mission that they accomplished and going like, hey guys, that was really sick. That was really cool. We pulled that off. Like maybe next time we could do this a little bit better, but ultimately how awesome is it that us as a team pulled that one off? And we are to go back and, and, and spend that time with the Lord saying, thank you. Thank you, God, for everything that you've done. Next time, you could probably do it a little bit. I wish you could have, no. It, th- thankfulness, always thankful. If we, were, if we spent all of our time in the thankfulness, there would be no room for anxiety because the time between the trials would be filled with understanding and recognizing how good God was the last time. The opposite of anxiety Thankfulness is the key that unlocks that peace, the opposite of anxiety, peace. Philippians 4, 7, as we move on, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, this is a promise. God asks us to, commands us to do something in his word and then promises something in return. I love these verses where he says, do this and this will happen. Because you know why I love it? Because he can't lie. He can't be wrong. He can't be wrong. He can't be wrong. The peace of God through prayer, supplication, especially thanksgiving, he promises us that he will guard our hearts with his peace. Peace, a state of national tranquility. National, I thought that was really awesome and interesting. National tranquility. Exemption from the rage and havoc of war. Exemption. Exemption, the rage and havoc of war. We got nations and war and havoc. God's peace is the exemption from those things. And contrasting that to our definition of anxious, which we looked at earlier, concerned or solicitous going down to be anxious for the issue of a battle, the the battle. And so what's happening is the anxiety that we're feeling is that battle in our hearts. The battle in our minds that's raging on and on and on. And the peace of God is the exemption from the havoc of that battle. The havoc of the battle that's happening. It's a spiritual battle for your mind. And I covered that in in pulling down strongholds. The message out of 2 Corinthians, we talked about that. The battle for your mind. This is the anxious heart, anxiety, the inward 
conflict that's happening, a war happening in your soul. He doesn't promise to deliver you from the battle, to exclude you from the battle, to remove you from the battle, but he promises something greater. He gives you something better than an answered prayer of supplication. He gives you peace, his peace, 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 tranquility of the nation that is your soul. Exemption from the rage and havoc in your soul. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. The peace that flies in the face of everything that we can wrap our own earthly heads around. And people see you and they're baffled by the fact that you have peace in the midst of all of this chaos. Because it goes beyond what I can comprehend in my own little brain. I may not understand what's happening. I may not have the perfect explanation explanation for you. I might, I might not be able to tell you exactly why what's happening is happening, but what I do know is that my God is bigger than the problem. What I do know is that he is stronger than the adversary, and in him I have my trust, not in what I can understand, but in what he understands, which is endless. It's endless. It's amazing how peace literally literally guards our hearts. It literally guards our hearts. To guard, to guard, protect by a military guard, either to prevent hostile invasion or to keep inhabitants of a besieged city from flight. You notice how all of these, these, these ideas, anxiety, peace, guard, all of these things have this military war connotation to them. God has made you his dwelling place, his holy temple through Jesus. He has made you inhabitable. Ha- sorry, he has, he has made you habitable. And now, through your relationship with him, he guards your heart from the enemy. The enemy wants to use the things that are going on in the world today to invade your hearts and invade your minds with fear and worry. And Jesus says, peace be still. In Ephesians Ephesians chapter four, Paul says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. What was created, a new man, which was created. And that that word literally is translated to make habitable, to make habitable, to found a city, a colony, a state. When God created in you a new person, he made you his place. He made you his temple. He made you that holy place. So through Jesus Christ, you are the dwelling place of God Almighty. And God Almighty will always provide for his people and always protect his place of habitation. Psalm 37, 25 says, I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. What's happening in Israel What's happening around the world to God's people, what's happened to God's people from the beginning of time is a macrocosmic picture of what is also happening on a microcosmic level in your own heart and in your own soul. God will never leave his people. God will never leave you. The anxiety that we're feeling that we're consumed with is diminishing the strength of God who holds the universe in the span of his hands. And there's an, another amazing quote by Spurgeon. You thought you escaped the beard, but you didn't. <laughs> My dear brother, do you know that sometimes God works a greater wonder when he sustains his people in trouble than he would do if he brought them out of it? For him, for him to let the bush burn on and yet not to be consumed is a grander thing than for him to quench the flame and so save the bush. God is being glorified in your troubles. And if you realize this, you will be ready to say, Lord, heap on the loads. If it be for thy glory, give me but strength equal to my day and then pile on the burdens. I shall not be crushed beneath them, but I shall be made to illustrate thy power. My weakness shall glorify thy might. Amen? Amen. What a remarkable quote. And as as we, we... start to, to wrap up here and, and moving on to, to verse eight. And, and this is, we understand, we understand that we're to, to, to not be anxious, to be anxious for nothing, to be anxious for nothing. But what do we replace that anxiety in our minds with? What are we to then think about? What do Christians meditate on? Instead of being in, 
instead of being absolutely um, filled with anxiety, we meditate on these things. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Man, we are so good at finding the opposite of all these things. Thinking about and filling ourselves with the opposite of all of these things is so easy. And there would be no mainstream media if they focused on these things. There wouldn't be. Because these things, do that, that doesn't make money for people. It's the havoc and the chaos and the anxiety that makes you go, I need to know more. I need to know what's next. I need to know what's happening. It's the anxiety. There's no, there's no peace in all of that. This is the anti-news, the anti-Instagram feed. This is the anti-media. Conservative or not, it's all brutal. It's all brutal. It's all brutal. And I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Okay? I'm not a doctor. I don't doubt that there's some medication that works for you or for your family members or whatever it might be. But what I do know is God's word is perfect. And, and, and I can promise you that there has never been anybody that only consume these things, only consume these things, and still struggled with anxiety. Only consume these things and still worried for the majority of their life. You are what you consume. You are what you consume. You will reap what you sow. And this is almost a law in scripture, a concept that is exhausted throughout scripture. You will reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 7 is just one of many. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. You cannot sow seeds of lies in your mind and expect to reap truth. You cannot sow seeds of dishonor in your mind and reap honorable thoughts. You cannot sow seeds of injustice and reap justice. You cannot sow seeds of impurity and lustfulness and reap purity. Ugly seeds, ugly fruit, not lovely. If all you meditate on is of bad report, you will be consumed with bad news. You cannot sow seeds of sin and reap virtue. And finally, there's only one thing praiseworthy in your life, and that's Jesus. Meditate on those things. Ultimately, you cannot sow seeds of anxiety in your brain, thoughts of anxiety. You cannot sow those seeds and expect to reap peace. It won't work. It won't work. Peace comes from meditating on the things of God. Meditating, meditating on these things. And please don't understand me. We must be informed. We have to remain informed. You cannot pray for things that you don't know about, right? You cannot pray and, and, and ask God to help with things that you're not informed on. I'm not asking you to be stupid in wh- where, when it, re- it comes to social issues and things that are happening. Obviously, our church crushes that. We are truth seekers. We want to know what's happening. We need to know what's happening. But what are you meditating on? Do you know everything that's happening and then you don't stop meditating on those things? When you, go to, when you lay down and you don't go to sleep, you just stay awake, meditating on all the things, the chaos, the brutality, the sin, all of it. Or are you meditating on these things? God's people meditate on these things. And lastly, in verse 9, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, th- these do, and the God of peace will be with you. We saw in verse 7 that Paul says, the peace of God will guard your heart. The peace of God will guard your heart. And now we're seeing in verse 9 that he's saying the God of peace will be with you. So we have the peace of God, but not just God's peace, not just him giving us peace, but actually him being the God of peace, being with us and alongside us. Micah 5, 4 through 5 says, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. This one shall be peace. God doesn't want to just give you more peace than you have now. He wants to be your peace, the source of your peace. He's given us the formula. 
God's peace will guard your heart. And beyond that, the God of peace will be with you. Give him your anxiety. Anxious for nothing, prayer for everything, and always thankful. Talk to him. Let him know, and he will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. This isn't something that you just get to think, and it just happens. This is active. Meditate. That active meditation on all of those things of the Lord. If you have to print out the verse, you should. If you have to memorize the verse, you should. It takes humility too. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. He's here to take your burden, whether big or small, whether you are anxious about the end of the world or you're just trying to get home without stopping at the liquor store. Whatever it might be, he cares for you. Give your cares to him. He is a a father in heaven that loves us. If the, the birds of the air don't have to worry about tomorrow and God provides for them, how much more will he provide for us created in his own image? Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite Danny back up. I'm going to read this verse, this last verse. And, and we're going to close in worship as we look to God for all of it. God, God wants you to give him your burden, which is insurmountable, and he gives you his in exchange. He gives you his in exchange, which is not heavy for you. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Any anxiety, any issue that you're feeling in your own heart, it's not from God. It's not from him. It's not from him. He doesn't give that to you. The burden that he gives to you doesn't exist. The, the enemy wants you to believe that all of the, this, what you're feeling in your heart is coming from God, and it's not. It is not. He loves you. He cares for you. He is the perfect father in heaven, and he's asking you to give it to him. He's a, and it's, it's an active giving. It's an active request. It's an active meditation on the things of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the ability that you've given us to, to gather together. Lord, your word that, that gives us answers. Lord, to all of life's issues, all of the problems that we're going through, all of the anxiety, Lord. Lord, I, I thank you that you don't take us out of the conflict, but you leave us there and we get to be that beacon of light, Lord. Ultimately, a witness, a testimony to your faithfulness, a testimony to your peace, a testimony to trust in you, what a life given to Jesus looks like with a light and easy burden. Lord, we, we, we put all of these, these sins off. Lord, all of the, the anxiety, Lord, we, we, we put it off and we ask you, Lord, to, to take up the space in our hearts that we've, we've now emptied ourselves of, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, amen. amen guys. We're gonna stand and sing this last song as we're looking to the Lord giving him all of it. Our prayer team is going to be up here up front. And if if you guys need prayer for anything, you want to continue to lay that stuff down at the Lord's feet. That's what what confession is. It's not confession unto salvation. It's confession unto healing. You got to request it. Jesus, I give this to you. Have have a verbal relationship with God Almighty. Amen? T- tell him, I- explain what you're going through. He knows, but he, he wants you to ask. He wants you to ask for that deliverance. Amen? Amen. Let's worship.